so a big part of any mineral show, as you know, is to wander around a little bit and uh, stick your head in here and there and see who you can find. Um, I am headed down to find a buddy of mine right now, Brian Costner with Mineral Classics. And uh, I've heard he's got some pretty cool things, as he usually does, um, on display. So come with us now. Let's go find Brian Costner with Mineral Classics. And there is the man right there, Brian Costner. Brian, how you doing, brother? Hey, Ryan. How are you? Good I to see you. I am doing great. I love to see you here. You guys got a great setup. Oh, thanks. Okay, the one question I like to ask all the people that I'm interviewing right. is, give me your impression of the new venue here at the, <laughs> for the Hard Rock Summit. Well, I mean, if, if anyone experienced the, the last few years downtown, I think there's a market upgrade to this facility. Uh, first of all, the convenience to get here is a lot more evident because it's directly off the highway. Um, larger parking lot, which is free, by the way, as opposed to, <laughs> Brian, our family spent over $600 on parking last year at the convention center between multiple cars to do that show. I'm not so. surprised. Last year was the first time in Den in my history that I ever came to the Denver show and didn't rent a car right? because I rented an Airbnb that I could take the subway there yep. because I didn't want yeah. to pay those crazy fees. Um, this venue, obviously, most shows take place in either a convention center or a hotel, this place is a newer building. It's been, I think, less than 10 years that this building's existed. Um, but it's in a gorgeous part of town on the north end of Denver where it's scenic and it's fairly quiet and it's not overcrowded. And it allows everybody to have a place, not just for a mineral show, but there's fine minerals here. The club show is here. We've got the gem show here. And there's even the tents outside. So you've got a little bit of everything all in one place. And the reception I've heard from both the dealers and the public is everybody's thrilled about this location. Absolutely. And so I, I hope this is something that is at least semi-permanent, but I would love to see us stay here for many years to come because I'm thrilled about our spot. We've had a good show so far, which you don't always expect from the first year at a new exactly, location. Right. So it's panned out well, and I'm really, really thrilled about it. Terrific. I know Christoph signed a five-year lease. So oh, great. For the next four years, we're well, going to be here. Hopefully we extend that well into totally, the future. Totally. <laughs> I would love to stay here. I love my location. I love my neighbors. And I really like the fact that there's a, a flow to this place. And people, after a year or two, will definitely understand where everybody's going to be. Like, I make a beeline to my favorite dealer easily. So, exactly. and, and I will say that the accommodations here are great. They've got coffee and water and snacks for people in the you know, hall. It's incredible so, yeah. what they provide. Yeah. You come in every morning, they have a huge tray of pastries and yeah. coffee and water and iced tea and it's like that doesn't cost us anything. Yeah. Oh, and it's God. free yeah. everybody gets in for free yeah. there's no charge for any you have to register but you get in for hey, free. man small price to pay to exactly. get in to see the best rocks and gems in denver absolutely so. absolutely well you have as i said a great booth here and this really jumps out and grabs <laughs> my eye you know i mean we've talked about this before i did this great uh trip down to mogok and made oh. the film to this day, it's still the best thing that Blue Cap's ever produced. I encourage everybody, go to the Blue Cap YouTube channel and Thank watch you. it. It's about an hour and a half, but it's not just a film about mining. It's a documentary about a part of the world where very few Westerners will ever have access. And if it wasn't for Federico being with you, you would have never got to go underground and do it in the first place. Absolutely. And right now, we couldn't even make that film. No, it, it's impossible. It's impossible. I mean... There are rumors that maybe it's changing, which would be great. But as of right now, we couldn't even make that small film changes. If we the People's to. Army seems to be progressing, and the Civil War might be going in their favor. But everything's always fluid there; it's constantly in flux, and no mining has taken place in Mogok in the last five plus years That's because of it. Yep. And that mine that you guys were in is completely flooded right now. The as, yeah, yep. Kadote Ta is done for all intents and purposes. A thousand meters deep, flooded to the top. And from what I understand, somewhere around $5 million cost to pump out all course, that water. Yeah. So it'd be like a year or two of just try, solid pumping. Try convincing an investor to put up that much money for the prospect of finding another ruby. No guarantee, mind exactly. you. And, you know, it's always somebody from the outside. It's not the locals who are mining this stuff. They have to get outside investors to come in and mine the rubies, which makes them even harder to find. So what we have here is a representation and by far, the greatest assemblage of world-class ruby specimens, matrix pieces, and single crystals, along with other gem minerals found in and around Mogok, all in one place. This so is, is, is the, everything on the shelves that we're looking at here, is this all Miramar? 
uh, everything here is from in and around the Mogok Valley, except for this. There's one piece up here in the corner, so don't film that one. But that's okay. it. But so oh, for the those rubies, who don't the know, Miramar, Bur Miramar is the ancient name for Burma. It's the name that's preferred now. And Mogok is a valley within Miramar. So historic mining district dating back over 1,200 years that we know for sure for ruby mining. But Brian, it's really only been within the last few decades that specimens have been coming out and yeah. preserved. The, the the vast majority of the mining is specifically for the acquisition of gem quality rubies, transparent crystals that are faceted into stones and. It's those gems that pay for the mining operation. Exactly. It's not the crystals, it's not the specimens. This is a happy accident that these things exist for the simple fact that these rubies are not completely transparent. And were they totally gem quality, they would have been cut immediately. Exactly. And even little crystals, like you could see this guy up here, this little ruby, if it was completely transparent, you could count on maybe a $100,000 value from something with the finest color and absolute transparency. Well, there's no mineral collector in the world that's gonna pay that kind of price for a single crystal like that. Now, Brian, so, that price that you have on it yeah. is an incredible price. That's a great price. Thank you, I appreciate it. We've uh, done our best to keep the prices not only competitive, but in line with where they were several years ago. This is not 2024 prices, this is prices before the pandemic. And if Jesus mining Christ. ever does resume in Mogok, I can promise everybody watching this video, the prices will be much higher than what you see listed on these things because you've got half a decade's worth of no mining taking place to make up for. So if they find any more rubies or spinels or any of the other minerals, the prices are going to be ridiculously high. These are really good prices. I mean, Thank you. 3,800 for this. I know. That's it, a steal. The reason and I don't, I never talk about price. I know, I know you don't. And that's what, I mean, I'm doing it now. I get it. Not because we're such good friends no, no, as no, we no, are, no, but no. because this is a You have a frame price. of reference for this, but for the public watching this and anybody who doesn't have a familiarity, it's important to iterate that these rubies are not only fine quality, but they're exceedingly rare. Everybody loves gem crystals, they tourmalines, tanzanite, roto, go down the list, whatever. Rubies are massively underrepresented, not only in the marketplace, but in people's collections. If I mention ruby and everybody watching this video, I want you to think right now, what's the best ruby specimen you know in a collection? Whether it be your own or a museum, I'm waiting, wait. Nobody said anything. Do you know why? Because nobody has them, Brian. And the reason nobody has them is because they're so rare. Yeah. And good pieces like this represent a tiny fraction of what comes out of the ground, especially in a matrix specimen. All five of these matrix pieces in the back are not only world-class with undamaged, doubly terminated crystals, but they're all unrepaired. And for anyone who's not familiar with this material, these ruby crystals have a high, slick, vitreous luster on the surface, and they form in marble. And that marble, combined with the smoothness of the rubies, do not go well together. And the crystals love to just pop out of the matrix. Right. Keep in mind, when they're mining, they're not trying to preserve specimens. So it's a minor miracle that any even exist for the simple fact that they want to pop loose crystals out and see if they're gemmy enough to turn into stones. Nobody underground is looking to, oh, well, maybe we can turn this into a great rock. Can't happen. So all of these pieces are miracles in and of themselves. The big one in the center, which we like to call Big Blue, big is blue. arguably a one of one for the fact that for its size, it's a large cabinet and large cabinet ruby specimens are not only few and far between, but they're impossible to find with unrepaired crystals. To the best of my knowledge, this is the only large cabinet specimen with a doubly terminated, undamaged, unrepaired ruby on the blue calcite matrix. And that's significant because I have found through exhaustive research and my own experience, the quality of the marble is directly proportionate to the quality of the rubies. So if you go directly to the right, we'll look at this piece here, and you can see that the quality of the marble is a bit more of a whitish hue with some golden spots from some oxides. And while the ruby crystal on there is good for what it is, it's not nearly as fine as the one to the left. And you can see that that distinct blue rhombic cleavage of the calcite is as good a quality as the marble gets there. And the better marbles produce the better ruby crystals. This piece is not only impressive, but it's also famous. It's pictured in the Mogok issue of the Mineralogical Record. 
And there's a lot of pieces in here. You know, this is a lot of pages. And obviously the cover piece has its own full color, full page pictures. The King of Mogok owned by Federico Barlocher. And then you go through and Ruby, 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 but these are all smaller photos. But there this one, full page. this one gets its own full page picture for a reason, because this one is special and rare and literally a one of one and arguably completely irreplaceable mm -hmm. for the simple fact that this was not a piece that came through the modern method of mining, which happens to be a crusher. And right. they take all this marble and they throw it down a belt and they crush it up into smaller pieces. And then they send it through a second layer of processing into even smaller pieces. This sucker, if it was around when they were doing the crusher process, would not exist in its current state, if at all. Because it's very likely that they would have popped the crystal directly out of the marble through the crusher. This thing was found underground and preserved in its state because they could tell immediately once the ruby was exposed, it's not gem quality, but maybe we can get something more out of this in a specimen. That's not going to happen anymore if they ever go mining again because everything will go through the crusher and you'll be lucky to get thumbnails if you get anything on Matrix whatsoever. So I want to stress not only the importance, but the extreme scarcity of something like this. We'll right. probably never see another one like it. Um, throw in the fact that the crystal is really good sized, incredibly well formed and lustrous. Like I said, it's doubly terminated. And I'm sure some people are asking, well, why is it such a big deal to have these things unrepaired on Matrix? And like I said, they pop out a lot because of the luster. But what makes these stay on the Matrix? Is it just dumb luck? Well, in a sense, yes. So if you pan over to the left, we can demonstrate how these crystals stay on the marble. There is an aspect to some of these crystals that is also fluky, but absolutely necessary to keep them on here. If we look at the back of this crystal, you can see that there's a slight hollow area where the marble is filled in and the ruby wasn't completely oh, smooth yeah, and euhedral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens with these rubies is that there's, especially in the back here, you can't see it, but it's evident. There was an impression, some kind of indentation, where the marble grabs it like the tentacles of an octopus and holds on to the ruby and keeps it on the matrix. If this was completely smooth on all sides, it definitely would have just popped off the marble when they were cobbing it away. Sure. And that's the same case for this one and Big Blue here and these others. They had some kind of a negative space where the marble could fill in and hold it and keep it on the matrix. And you're talking about less than one one thousandth of a percent of these are on matrix and even less of them are unrepaired on matrix. Um, like I said, everybody's heard of Ruby. It's ubiquitous, the king of gems, but nobody has a good one. And I think it's amazing that there's so many other gem minerals in the world and nobody has a good Ruby. And I'm highlighting these in order to show people not only are they rare, but when you get the finest crystals, they're exquisite. And I think especially top collectors should aspire to have an amazing ruby in their collection. Yeah, red is a fairly common color in the mineral world. But, but it's, a, it's, it's a very much loved color. Without a doubt. World. It might be the most popular color. There was an old adage that uh, Cal Graver told me when I was a teenager. He said red cells. Yeah, and yeah. it comes down to things like rhodochrosites or even, you know, um, tourmalines, rubellites, you name it always popular with collectors. And the reason that those things are popular is because they're fairly abundant. It's easy to get them. If you want a tourmaline, we could go into almost any booth in this building and find one for somebody. Same goes for rhodochrosite or tanzanite. Nobody has these rubies. rubies. You yep. can't find them anywhere. And you have firsthand direct knowledge of what it's like to get these things. And it's not your traditional mining where you're following a vein underground for an no, ore body. This is random. That's the thing that uh, I wanted to add to it. Something like this, where you have all that uh, uh, marble in there, especially the blue marble, there are no indicators in it that there's a ruby in there. No. That's why everything has to be crushed up. The things, as it gets smaller and smaller and goes through the crushing machines, Finally, it gets to a point where you have people sit, literally squatting and hand cobbling these things yep. until the marble gets so small that they're confident there's nothing left. There. Exactly. And that's why large matrix pieces are virtually unseen because they don't care about matrix. They're just looking for crystals exactly. and they want to remove them from the matrix. Um, and, and the same thing goes for the spinels. Typically, uh, good gem quality spinels are worth a fair amount as cut stones. Um, I, I do think that... Anyone who's ever 
been around a gem show could see faceted rubies and have an appreciation for their beauty. Right. But to me, good crystallized examples are rarer and more desirable because they're virtually unseen in the marketplace. And this shelf you're panning across is mostly spinels, but it's a great demonstration of the various hues seen, whether it's this purplish mauve color to the silvery lavender to what they call ruby spinel in the back, the dark red one, to peaches and oranges and all kinds of shades. Spinels are found in almost every color of the rainbow, and some of the best pieces come from Mogok as well. Yeah, well, actually, I believe the big ruby in the British crown is not a ruby, it's a spinel. It's a spinel that was believed to have come from Mogok, and in recent years, it has been determined that it was actually found in Tajik. Tajikistan. Really? Yeah, it, th because the big spinels, like if we look at this guy up here, this is one of the best big red spinels yeah, to come super, out. Look at the color, color in there, but it's not gem quality. Yeah, It's yeah. translucent, but it's not transparent. There's never really been a spinel of that size in the, the Black Prince's crown jewels that was transparent, and they're almost certain it came out of Tajikistan. So um, just another myth throughout history because, you know, obviously all the mining in Myanmar, Burma was directly tied to the British for all those years. They assumed it, that's where British it came rule. from. Yeah. That was actually a Tajik, most likely Spinel, not Ruby, Spinel, right. but world class. Anyone who's seen the, the crown jewels can appreciate it for what it is. One last thing, because some people might get a kick out of this. Oh, There's chromium in do. these I'm things. I'm going to turn right? off my light here. Okay. So chromium is what gives rubies their color. And it's also something that inhibits crystal growth. So the more chromium, the richer the color, but you usually get a smaller crystal because of it. Now, that's why this guy is such an anomaly because a piece of this size and quality should not exist. You really shouldn't have one this big with such a rich color, but it's not just what you see to the naked eye. You put a little UV on there and boom, mm -hmm. look at that. You talk that. about red and every one of these will pan through the case real quick Take a look at the fluorescence on these guys. Look at that. Can we turn off the, uh, yeah. the case lights? Let's kill it here. There we go. There we okay. Go. Look at that red, okay. folks. Look at this. Go up to big blue here. Now it's big red. All of them, even the smaller ones, show this tremendous fluorescence. And, that, and, and the spinels, too. We'll do the spinel here in the front row. Look at that. That's the chromium. And, and I'll tell you, I've actually seen the King of Mogok have with, you? with a black light on it. Oh, I'm it sure it's, it just, just lights up the room. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, incredible. Breathtaking. So I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank you, Brian, for coming over. It means the world to me that everybody shares in not only what these are as crystallized specimens, but there's a history here and a legacy and something greater than just mineral collecting because there's only four precious gems in the world. Ruby is one of those gems and it's highly underrepresented in the market. Absolutely. And anybody who takes mineral collecting seriously should consider getting one of these because it's possible, not, I'm not saying certain, but it is possible we may never see them again. It's going to take a lot. They're not just gonna start popping out of the ground. And like I said, you know, uh, that, that talk earlier this year that Federico did at the, the Fine Mineral Gallery, mm -hmm. He showed the year's production from one of the mines and all of the crystals filled up the palm of the hand of the mine owner yep. and they weren't very big. So even when they find stuff, it can sometimes be tiny pieces. These are exceptional for what they are. And I said, like I said, this is 30 plus years worth of acquisitions. Maybe one killer ruby comes out per year from the entire valley. And we've got so many of them here, but I've got some good news for Tucson. Yes. Not only well, these specimens be on display, but we're going to get bigger and better with more pieces from more localities and well-known collections. So I want everyone to keep that in mind as January and February rolls around. Come see us. We're at the Fine Mineral Galleries on Leicester. We are going to have a bigger display with more pieces, more variety, and it'll be even more impressive than what's in front of us now. Absolutely. And I want to clarify to the viewers that it's the Fine Mineral Galleries at Leicester, which is part of Mineral City, and not confuse it with the Tucson Fine Mineral uh, Gallery, yeah. which is further down right. the street. So, we're, so I want them to make sure that they find you. We're literally on the opposite side of Leicester from Mineral City, right. and then directly behind La Fuente. In 10 seconds, you could walk over to us. Right, and you're so. in the same building complex as 
Marcus Budil, Budil Wally, Wendell, Wally Wendell, Mike Wendell, Bergman, and Aurora Mackie. Minerals, and yep. Sammy. Everybody. There's only six of us over there, but got a nice big space. And, and for those of you who haven't seen what's out in Tucson, <laughs> you haven't seen the inside of that space. It's spectacular. I encourage anybody coming to Tucson this year, please come see us, even just to glance at things, but enjoy the space, enjoy the rocks. It's It's been a passion project for me, literally for most of my adult life. I care about the minerals here more than almost anything I've encountered. This is something significant for the fact that at different mineral forming environments, you've got the marbles for the rubies and the spinels, and you've got the pegmatites for things like the topaz and the tourmalines. And then you can go into more of the metamorphic stuff like the peridot here. And they're literally sitting right next to each other. You can walk from one to the next. It's incredible Absolutely. how much, and they all produce gorgeous gem crystals. So I want to open everybody up to Mogok, embrace this stuff, come see us. There's going to be more great pieces in the future. Fantastic. And Brian, I'm going to add one last thing. Okay. Going back to the film that Barlocher and I made. Yeah. The whole premise behind the film that we came up with before we even committed to doing it yep. was we wanted to make a film that could show people that a ruby at $1 million a carat was cheap. Exactly. And that was That's how years, rare that was years ago. Yes. Okay. That was 2008. Teen, right. I so more than half a decade ago, and you're lucky you went when you did because everything just fell apart shortly afterwards. Everybody thinks that rubies are, you know, oh yeah, rubies are kind of expensive. No, rubies are really expensive at the high end. And you're right. They're still cheap for what they are because one stone like this, like you said, million dollars a carat, that may be a one in a million ruby as well. If you're lucky, yeah. maybe one in 10 million because they're not that common to begin with. And to find exceptional ones, it's just such a tiny slice of the pie. So I, I, I really appreciate you coming by. Thank you to everybody for watching. It means a lot to me. And if anyone wants to reach out, you'll give them my contact information. Contact information's on the screen right now. Brian, thank you because I think you're actually doing a service to the mineral community. Thank you. To help people understand and to educate. And like I said, I will reiterate, do. I want everyone to go watch Brian's video about <laughs> his adventure in Mogok. No, no, it's it, yeah, I'm, no, thank it, you. I, it's no bootlicking here. What you did was a once in a lifetime opportunity and perhaps may never be available to anybody, anybody else ever again. But that's why we do this, to document these things, to talk about the history behind it. And if it wasn't for Federico, you have no access. So thanks to him as well for making it all yeah. Possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I encourage everyone to go look at Federico's stuff online too, because he's got a lot of informative information about his time traveling through Mogok. Yeah, he is Mr. Mogok. Without a doubt. And I hope to be Burma Brian one day. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Brian, thank cool. you, man. Love Thanks, your man. Brother. Appreciate it. Be good.